Dr. Nadine. Welcome to the Mitchell Report Unleashed podcast. Oh, thank you for having me. Yes, we're here to talk about a lot of things, I feel like, as we've entered into this fourth quarter. You know, yourself, you're big into coaching, you know, women, leaving abusive relationships, things like that. And to kind of go into your little bit of your story real quick, I would say just give the brief introduction to the to the audience there about uh, who you are and all that good stuff. Yeah, so um, uh, my name is Nadine Macaluso, but my patients call me Dr. Nay because it's better than that long, crazy Italian name. And I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. And my journey to get here was quite bumpy. I would say. And when I was 22, I was modeling in New York City and met the infamous Jordan Belfort, Wolf of Wall Street. I met him as a par- at a party as the movie shows. And after that, he pursued me like crazy to the point of uh, paying somebody $15,000 to get us to get set up and have dinner. Yep. And then about six months later, I ended up bumping into him in a gym in New York City. And he asked me out. We went on a date, got married, had kids, and the rest you get to see in the movie. (laughs) Of course, of course. When we talk about the movie and things like that, you know, when you look back at how the movie was told, what was your first indication? It was like, was that really me? (laughs) What was your first thing that came up? You know, I got to, you know, you have to remember Jordan wrote a book first, right? So at least I got eased into this whole concept in a way. And then uh, Paramount allowed my husband and I to go for a private screening at Paramount Theaters. And so I remember sitting down and looking at my husband and saying, okay, this is so weird. And we watched it. And of course, you know, it was a lot of emotions, but a lot of it was very funny. And afterwards, I looked at him and I said, you know what? It wasn't that bad. It was okay. Yeah. (laughs) You know, considering I had no idea how Martin Scorsese would want to portray my character, even though I did get to meet Margot Robbie. But yeah, I I did meet her because she wanted my Brooklyn accent. But, um, you know, you never know how, you know, people have license to portray you however they want. And I was pleased because I looked like a young girl who fell madly in love wanted to protect her kids and was just following this crazy guy around. No, no, absolutely. And there's a lot that's there and it speaks to who you are now, you know, and things like that. And the reason why we're, we're really here to talk about, you know, signs of trauma bonding in a relationship and things like that. And speak to the audience, like what are the signs of trauma bonding and how can they distinguish from healthy emotional attachment? Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, a trauma bond is a toxic, dysfunctional relationship between two people. And I write about it is in with intimate partners. And so the signs of it are, first of all, usually it starts with love bombing, which, you know, Disney movies had told us that that's the way love should be, right? Or rom-coms, just tons of adoration, admiration, big gifts, big gestures of love, very fast paced. I'm going to love you forever after two weeks. Right. I found the one. And so that's a very important sign to look for, because even though it feels good, doesn't mean it is good. That's right. And yep. a lot of times when you meet someone, they'll, they might say, oh, my ex was so crazy. Right. And then you just might start to think to yourself, why was she crazy? Or why was he crazy? Right. And then you'll start to see a lot of words, not matching actions. Yo, guys, what's going on? I appreciate you. Thank you. Turn on all bell notifications, subscribe, like, and comment to the podcast. It's the best way to stay up to date. And hey, it helps us gain the clarity and boost ourselves into that algorithm. We appreciate the support each and every day, each and every week. Let's keep on going to keep on growing. Peace. With the person. And what will happen is that the person who you initially met, Romeo, I like to call him, actually starts to act like Dirty John. <laughs> and <laughs> you start to see, like, they, like, they're just, they start to lie. You catch them in little lies. And when they lie and you confront them, they go ballistic and get defensive. 
right? Or they're very jealous and possessive when they have no reason to be. You know, you get in friends groups all the time, and I feel like now you as the expert, you hear that a lot. You know, you go to dinners, you go out for a couple of drinks, things like that, coffee shop talk, and you hear or you overhear conversations where people are like, oh, yeah, my ex is crazy. My ex is crazy. And I'm at like, some points of times I'm like, you feel like you want to turn and be like, was you sure it wasn't you? Right. You sure it wasn't you? Right. <laughs> because exactly. at the end of the day, it's like, like, come on, you can't keep picking all the crazies. Eventually, you got to look at yourself and say that you're probably the crazy one. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of times, you know, people act crazy, right? When they're being lied to, when they're being gaslit right? When they're being betrayed, right? I mean, if, you know, if somebody presents as, like I say, Romeo or Prince Charming, and then all of a sudden you're with the mask falls and you're with a totally different person who's cruel and controlling and betraying, right? It's pretty crazy making. <laughs> Steve, speak about that, right? Because it's like, even I hear a lot of, and I think it's, I think it's more women, not to, not to, in individualize, you know, women and yeah, things like that. Right. We, we know with, it happens to men too, of course. Yeah. yeah. Dealing yes. with narcissism and stuff like that, right? And and self-confidence, you know, spot the difference. What what is true narcissism look like? Because I feel like everybody uses that word, but they don't yeah. exactly know what the word means. Right, right. And and I mean, yes, it gets thrown around like crazy and it's a pet peeve of mine. And you know, and what the way we think of a narcissist is a very grandiose, braggart sort of person, right? Who's very charming and charismatic and very confident, right? And a smooth talker. Usually they're great salespeople. Um, but the thing is that actually their whole life's mission is just to get admiration and attention. Right. Well, they have two life missions. That's the first life mission. And then if they don't get that, and first of all, then they'll go about very dysfunctional ways like cheating or getting other people's attentions when they're outside, you know, that are outside the relationship. And then if you also confront them and tell them they're less than perfect and you actually show them who they're, who they really are, they go ballistic. You know, so that's what we would think of as a true narcissist. But what I call this person is a pathological lover. Mm, I never heard about. I never heard that phrase before. Speak on that. Yeah, pathological because pathological lover. Because pathological means mentally unwell, and I think this person is much more than a narcissist because they will use, exploit, harm, and betray anyone and everyone to get their needs met for money, power, pleasure, and status. Mm. Right. And I believe anybody that would do that is mentally unwell. So they have psychopathy. They have some sadism. They have some Machiavellianism, which means they're manipulative. Usually they have a substance abuse disorder. They're compulsive. They're impulsive. They're very complex, slippery people. Do you feel like, because... In, in my point of view, do you feel like there's healing for these narcissistic, you know, men, women out yeah. there? Can they really necessarily heal from that or no? Well, I mean, listen, a personality disorder is very hard to heal from because it's ego syntonic, meaning it's not like a mood disorder. When you feel anxious or depressed, you're like, I want to get rid of this. When you have a personality disorder, it's who you believe yourself to be, Right. So it's, it's very different in that sense. And also if they're getting all their needs met for money, power, pleasure, and status, if they're exploiting people, if they're becoming wealthy, if they're having all the power, what impetus do they really have to change? You know, so and, and, and listen, now, have I seen some people change for sure? And we're both in the business of change. Right. So we want to believe people can change, but they really have to want to change. And I've seen a lot more than not, not change. Yeah. For the ones that are listening to this right now. Right. And they maybe have a friend or themselves are dealing with narcissistic tendencies yeah. from a lover. How, how do they leave that 
relationship and feel safe within self. Yeah, because usually when you tell that person you're going to leave, that can actually be a very treacherous time. So what I say and what I write in my book is that make a decision to leave, right? You have the, you have the decision in your mind. Do not share it with them. Get organized behind the scenes. Now, we always talk about how they wear a mask, like they wear a mask in public and they're different with us. Now you have to wear the mask. Hmm. Wear the mask towards them, plan behind the scenes, and you know, make sure you're in therapy or speaking to someone. Um, get all of your documents if you're married together, right? Get a credit card in your name. Really plan and strategize. And then I'd say, don't ever let them see you coming, and you then you leave. Easier said than done. Because I'm yeah. now speaking from the the audience yeah. perspective, because they'll hear yeah. that and they're like, well, like. Nadine, come on, let, 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 like, what's the secret? Just, just up, pack the bags and just walk out the door. Like, well, yeah, I mean, that's why you have to plan, you know, behind the scenes. Like you can't just do it in a day, right? You, this is where you have to be really strategic and methodical. And it's hard because when they're pissing you off and you want to be emotional and go crazy, but that's where you got to say, you know what? I have a long plan. I really want to get away from this person. And you got to change all your passwords, delete all the pictures. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that I talk about in my book that you have to do um, and lean on others. Don't do it in isolation. No, no, that's that's well said. Communication is a big thing. It's yeah. Big thing. And, you know, and I think, know. yeah. And I think that when you speak to communication, you know, and like learning yourself and being in a toxic relationship with a narcissist and then coming out it's the evolution now of like you're wanting to maybe see what love it feels like again you know yeah. what if what does it feel like what does it taste like i feel like everybody has their own definition of love what would you say as far as creating like self-awareness around yourself to like go out we already know about the healing you know the therapy all of that but yeah when does it when is it safe to go out and date again and not have like preconceived notions with you know, maybe another man or a woman that may present, yeah, or, you know, that right. type of thing. You know, I mean, listen, when I, when a, when a person leaves this relationship, I always say, turn the mirror back on you, learn about your attachment patterns, learn about your personality traits, learn about how you're wired for love first and foremost, right? Learn about who these pathological people are so you can avoid them. And then I would say after a year, I think it takes a year it, when it depends upon how long you've been in it to really heal and get to know yourself. So you can learn to trust yourself again. Right. And then you go on and then you go and you see, you know, if, if a guy is not curious, big red flag, <laughs> you know, if they're not interested in what you do or how you do it, or, and it, I always say, if somebody can't hear you, they can't love you. Mm. Love that you say that. Speak speak a little bit more into that. I like that. Yeah, you know, when I I'm I'm currently married for twenty four five years, no, twenty three years to I think married and twenty five years together. And I'll never forget the first time my current husband and I had an argument, and he was like, "Oh yeah, I, you know, I hear that," and I was like, "What? You you hear me?" He was like, "Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. I get it." And I just was like, oh, okay, I forgot what this feels like. And he could have empathy for me. He didn't just have to be right or have it his way. And that was really, and hence I'm still with him. And that's where I feel like the pendulum is swinging right now in, in relationships. I think that everything we've dealt with in life from like your story and then you have the pandemic story and people were breaking up and people were just not wanting to be with each other. Now it's like, we're so hungry for what true human connection really is. Yes. And it was kind of, I was talking to a group of friends before I coming on to this about an hour, hour and a half ago. And it's like, now we have a, a, a shield over our heart, right? Yeah. That we don't, 
know how to get into. You know, if it's something yeah. that somebody could be so good to us, but we don't recognize it because we're so hurt from past situations now that yeah. we're like, what's dating anymore? I don't want to date nobody. I'm tired from dating, you know? And it's just, do you yeah. live alone? Do you just True. keep, you, you know? Yeah, but, you know, and, and, and our hearts do get armored, right? But here's the thing. Love is a risk. And it's a risk worth taking because we're social beings and we're built for connection, right? And it's unfortunate that we learn how to read, write, and do arithmetic, but nobody teaches us the fourth R of relationships. But I, I think, you know, you have to be brave to be willing to open up your heart and be vulnerable and reveal yourself. But Absolutely. I don't know any other thing that's more worth it. Well, I think some folks would be like, well, you know, <laughs> why do I want to be in a relationship? You know, I could be in and get a dog and be be good, you know, for, for however amount of time in life, you know. And sometimes that's not the answer. I think it's always just surrounding yourself with good people. That's good right. Good energy. If you that's don't right. have good energy in this world, like, it's hard to, it's going to be very hard to navigate. Especially now, like, I've got, you have your group and your core friends, but then you have your networking connections. And I always feel now it's like the networking connections hold more substance now sometimes. Because it's like, you're talking about the same thing. You have the same similar patterns. And not to dismiss the loved ones that are family or friends in your life, they may not understand what it is you're wanting to do, where you're wanting to go. And I think yeah. that's where those disconnects happen and things like that. Yeah. And, you know, we have different people for different seasons, right? And people fall into different buckets and that's okay. Right. But I, I think the main message is not to close off your heart because in the end, the only one you hurt is you. When anyone hears your story and we talk about rebuilding back self-esteem. Yeah. Right. Because that's something that you had to do. Mm -hmm. Give us like three things you had to take with inside of you to make that acceptance to rebuild back your self-esteem. Yeah, well, I mean, to rebuild your self-esteem, first of all, you have to have the courage to face your fears. You cannot buy confidence at a at Costco on a big shelf. You know, <laughs> like I'd love sure. to, I wish. But so you have to have the confidence to face your fears and because when we face those fears and then we come out the other side, we're like, oh, I did it. This is amazing. Right. And that's really important. And also having the um, having follow through, having a stick to itness, you know, setting goals and reaching them and, and having the grit to reach them. Right. Because life is hard, you know, like work is hard, right? I worked all day. You're like, okay, hey, come on. It's 7.15. I'm like, I'm doing it. <laughs> you know, so like keep your commitments because the opposite of self-abandonment is commitment to yourself. So I think you have to have courage. You have to have commitment and um, you have to have support because resilience can't be built in isolation. You have to have people saying you can do it. I saw you do that. And then slowly but surely, you can build real internal self-esteem, which is high regard for your own self. But if you just lay on the couch all day and watch TV and don't keep your commitments and don't push yourself, you're not going to regard yourself. And that doesn't mean there haven't been days I don't do that. But you give yourself a day, a mental health day, and then you pick yourself back up. So happy you say that because a lot of high achieving, high functional business, sports, coaches, leaders in whatever industry, yeah, they do have those times where you of need course. that time just to sit on the couch. Of course. Maybe grab a bag of chips, maybe maybe grab, you know, that slice of pizza. Yes. And just indulge because we're all human. You That's know what I mean? Right. We can't be a hundred percent ladies and gentlemen all the time 
No. I'm not. I, I'll be honest. Like so many people look at, they say podcast, seven and a half years, consistently going over 500 episodes. How do you do it? But then still work and still do all these other things because I want it, you know? Right. Right. But just sometimes I'm like, you know, the, the, I come off the slide <laughs> and I sit oh, there and I just chill for a sec. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, we're human beings and, the, you know, there's all this pressure with like all this biohacking and these, you know, like live so rigidly. And the way I say it is, listen, you don't want to be rigid. You don't want to be chaotic. Like everything you want to find a balance. Because we also got to play and be creative and have fun. Just can't have too much fun. <laughs> <laughs> I had that in my 20s. I'm good. <laughs> no, no, for sure. Speaking about that, though, too, like, not to really, really hype, put hyper focus there, but like those, those parties, those moments, without saying too, too much, because I'm pretty sure it's in the book, like, speak to that a little bit. Those, those, those parties must have been something, you know? Oh. Yeah, no, I can speak to it. Um, no, those parties were, were crazy. They were wild. I mean, we were in our 20s. I was 22 when I met him. He was 28. And um, they were just pure debauchery, really. I mean, I think they were less when, when, the, when the wives were there, as the movie depicts. I think it was a lot worse when it was just them. But, um, you know, I also made some great friends. I still have uh, one girlfriend of 35 years from that time, you know, and it was, it was, it, it had its fun moments, right? But it had a lot of bad moments and then the bad outweighed the fun. No, no, absolutely. Was there anything that you feel like you would change in that trajectory of that life, like meeting him and then coming out? Like, was there? You know, I wouldn't change anything because I have two beautiful children. I have, a th I have my daughter's a therapist. My son's a rapper, actually. And, oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah, and he's okay. a musician. And so I would do it all again, you know, to have them. I mean, where there were some parts I wish I could have left out, perhaps. But, you know, listen, it's a crazy thing that I have this insane existence, right, with this movie that's filled with misogyny. And then and drugs and craziness. And then I leave him, I move to California. I'm like, oh, I'm done with that life, right? But life always happens while we're planning it. Then he writes a book, then he makes a movie. And I'm like, are you kidding me? This Greek tragedy of a life that I've spent 20 years in therapy, <laughs> trying to overcome is now haunting me. But what I did, and I wanna offer this to anybody who's listening, I surrendered. And I said, this is bigger than me. And hence, I become a therapist. And now I built a whole practice around helping women deal with the very thing that I endured that was a movie made about my life. And now I get to use that movie as an engine to help women everywhere, or people, but everywhere. I, I couldn't write it better if I tried. It speaks to It speaks to that we all have, how do I say this? We all, some folks say that our life may have been already written for us. We're it just seems, it seems basically like the actors or the actresses in it. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. I mean, I could have never imagined that all of this would happen, you know, but I'm 56 now. So mm -hmm. to anybody who's young, you know, you have to have a dream yeah, and a loose dream and you don't always have to know how. But you just have to show up every single day. Absolutely. And on the days that you're going to rest, but Absolutely. just keep showing up, and then it will, it will emerge. I remember back in so over here in Canada, we we say go by like grade one to grade eight, and yeah. it was after grade eight. My principal at the time looked at my parents and said, "I see Rory in radio." Now this was many many moons ago. Really? And it's so wild because, you know, the sports talk as you're growing up as a young kid, like I remember getting yeah. up every single morning, six o'clock, you know, breakfast in hand and I'm recapping the sports. <laughs> That's just what life was. Right. And yeah. then you're on the basketball court. And then I think back about it and I'm like, look how long that's been. And now it's radio, but radio has evolved to now podcast. Right. And it's so wild. And so many people hear that story and they're like, 
wow, sometimes yeah. it's just that person sees something in you. Yeah. And they just position it just like that, you know? Yeah. You well, just you never have, give up. You have, you have a perfect voice. Thank you. Appreciate that. that. And by the way, my grandson's name is Rory. Oh, look at that, right? <laughs> we're twinning. <laughs> yeah, we're twinning. Yeah, no, right. And and so, yeah, I think there is probably something written. You know, if you told me that 20 years ago, I don't know if I would believe it. But again, because I could have never planned all this, and yet it all worked out. Oh, so true. Before we enter into dating, right, there's this thing that <laughs> I feel like we all go through. And I know that this is, you're the expert here. Yeah. Identifying the red flags. Speak to it from a woman's perspective, going to dating or talking to that new man in their life. Yeah, well, I, you know, th th this is an interesting topic because... You know, we always hear about red flags, right? And we touched on some of them um, earlier, but I was working with a young girl the other day and she said she's dating now. And what I say to my girls when they're dating, I'm like, let's take the pressure off. You're in a relational lab and they love it. And they're like, oh, that doesn't make it sound so serious, Dr. Nay. I like that. So I said to her, I said, you know what? She goes, I went on this date, this date, this date. I said, okay, well, what didn't work? She said, well, one of them, we just didn't share the same values. But the second guy, he was way too aggressive. And he wasn't curious. He wanted to dominate the conversation. You know, he was nice enough. She, but those were her red flags. And those are really good red flags to look out for. Is that person open to listening to you? Do they want to dominate the conversation? Because again, if they're love bombing you, it's going to feel good and it's not so easy to see. Right? So you got to give it a few dates usually to really see who this person is. And then another girl who I, who I work with, which is a great story, she was da she's dating now after a really pathological lover. <laughs> I mean, through the roof. But she's dating and she's she went on the date with this guy and she was like, you know, I don't want to have sex till for for a while. What should I do? I'm like, tell him. Tell him this is what you want. These are your this is be honest with him. Be transparent. And then she sent me a picture. She goes, Here's here we are. It went great. He agreed. You see, when I hear that, that speaks to knowing self, speaking on boundaries and non-negotiables. That's right. You know what I mean? And I think that I'm someone, like as a male, I can say this, is that I never enter that field physicality first. Right. And some men will look at me and say, what? You know? <laughs> right. And I'm saying, what no. No, because here's the thing is, you want to get to understanding who that person is. Right. I'm not saying you got to go into the deep, dark secrets day date number right. one. Right. But it's understanding that you're setting the attention. That's not what it's all about. You know what I mean? That's the bonus. And yeah. I know some people hear that and be like, you're so weak. You're so this. You're so that. And it's like, no, I'm secure with who it is that I am. I know yes. what I want. And I like how you speak to when she mentioned about him being assertive, because I do have that type of assertiveness. Yeah. But it comes with that, I know I can dominate a conversation, but I know that I keep the space safe. So when you look at me, you're like, who is this guy? Is this the Oracle I'm talking to? Right. You know what I mean? And things like yeah. that. But it's yeah. it's just understanding who you are with yourself. So that's, that's right. It, there's nothing wrong with say, stating your claims and boundaries. And I champion everyone. And like, anytime I do dating episodes, I say is be upfront and open in your, with your with your intentions. And just That's see right. where that person's going to be, where they meet That's you at. Right. That's right. Because one of the things of a pathological person is they hate boundaries. So just by stating your boundary, which for her was, you know, she wanted to wait a while before she was, you know, intimate. He didn't say I'm out or he didn't push the boundary. He was like, I hear you. And that works great. And they also hate it. You know, if, if someone can't, um, if you have a need, 
like let's say you're sick or you're something happens in your family and you get super emotional right and you need try to lean on that person and they're like oh, i can't deal with that no good because you need you need to have somebody who can meet your emotional needs absolutely and i know the ones that are listening to this appreciate that you know because Again, like it dating out here is rough. <laughs> it's rough. It's so what, rough. What part of Canada are you in? Toronto. Toronto. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It dating out here is rough, and it's the couple of my networking connects. We are all talking about the same thing about like how rough it is, and right. it's it's again like we're some of us are tired. We're tired of it because it's just like to f- go out there to meet new people, have conversation. I just say is honestly focus on what you have going on in your life. Yeah, everything tends to work its way. That's you right. start meeting people on like just the the weirdest of places. You you could be somewhere and then right. you're at a function, and then you start talking with somebody, and then next thing you know, numbers are exchanged. Next thing you know, you guys are out for <laughs> you guys are out for lunch or whatever, or whatever you're doing. The next thing you know, rings are on fingers, and out come kids. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, Rory. Why is dating so rough? Do you think, from your perspective? I love that you say that. I love that you say that. I should turn the microphone to you now. <laughs> well, I'm just, I'm genuinely curious, you know, from your I perspective. Think it's bec- yeah, I think it's because nobody's listening to, to each other. We're not listening to each other. And I think that people are bringing emotional baggage from past relationships. Yeah. Or what tends to be happening now, because I see this a lot, and a lot of men and women that I network with say the exact same thing. People are out here dating two different people at the same time. Right. So oh. they'll be talking to you. Yeah. And then wanting to get to know you. But then what they're doing on the back end is they're getting all the other perks from the other person. And mm. that's very, very common, which is to the point where it's like it's it's kind of unfortunate. That's yeah, why I go back and we. it's like they want to just keep their options open just in case this doesn't work out. Then they have this or this doesn't work out. They have that. Is that. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I feel like. Dating around is one thing, but you got to be open and honest. Like, i rather go out for a date with someone and a lady looks at me and says, hey, like, listen, you're not the only person I'm talking to. Right. That allows me to proceed now. Where do I want to go? Do I want to continue to go forward or do I just withdraw my energy? Nine times out of ten, I'm going to withdraw my energy. I think a lot of people will because it's like, why do you want to be around for that? Why do you want to be the back burner? You know? Right, right, right. And that's why I think a lot of people don't say it, right? And that's not fair because they're not being fully honest and they're not allowing the other person to make an educated decision. So then the other person doesn't know and then they do get dropped, but they don't know it's because they had somebody else in the wings the whole time, right? Yeah, Absolutely. it's tricky. Yeah, it's, I, I, I hear it from all my all my patients, how tricky it is to date. And you know, you know where it gets even more is that when it doesn't work with that person, they tend to come back around and be like, oh, hey, what's going on? How you been? Right. You can't, I, I try to say this, unless it's something, the only way I think that's going to happen if it was something, if you guys weren't going to work because maybe there was a conflict within work, they travel around the world. Right. Maybe there's, you know, maybe something was going on with them, you know, family, things like that. I think right. that's the only right. way it's going to work. Right. That's the only way. Right. Because once right. you can start involving other parties, that's where it gets, it's just like, well, I'm getting yeah. the second consolation prize, you know? Right. 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 And it's, um, then it tricks up people's insecurities. And, but that not being transparent thing is really, I think is very prevalent. And especially with, pathological people because they will Absolutely. lie right to your face without even blinking so true. and that's so true. that's 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 really hard to deal with yeah. with your book now mm-hmm. right real quick speak to the audience that book was there a, a difficult chapter to, to write or this was it just let me just put my heart and soul into everything well you know, I mean, I'm writing about a very tough concept, which is trauma bonds, right? And um, and the hardest chapter to write was chapter two. It's called, Is He Twisted or Tender? 
and it's writing about the pathological partner in the relationship and writing, writing that part was tough because you're writing about not the best part of humanity. And so that was not the funnest chapter to write, but all in all, it's very hard to write a book. It was a very humbling experience. But what I love about it is that women direct message me from all over the world saying, I feel seen, I feel validated, thank you. You get it. And that to me is, it just fills my heart up. Every it, No matter how many times I hear it, it's just, I'm like, yes. Yeah, I love You're changing it. lives though. You're changing lives, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, yeah, I, I, I'm helping, you know, I'm just there. They feel validated. They feel seen. They don't feel crazy anymore. And the last chapter is about how to heal. So it's, it's, I think it's an important piece of work. Absolutely. And give the title of the book. So the title is called Run Like Hell. A Therapist's Guide to Recognizing, Escaping, and Healing from Trauma Bonds. Okay. And that's in paperback, hardcover? Paperback. It's an ebook, and it's an audio book, too. Love that. Got to get the audio book. Yeah. I'm an audio book guy for my commutes. <laughs> yeah, and I did I did the audio book myself. So you get yes. this ridiculous nasal voice. <laughs> oh, stop it. Stop it. <laughs> no, Listen, I I'm think... I'm from Brooklyn. I can't help it. No, no, I, I feel like audiobooks for me is the best way for me to learn and things yeah. like that. And I love when the audiobook is done by who wrote the book, right? Because yeah. it's you hear the tones, you hear the emotion and stuff like that. Not to take away from the conversation, um, Gary Vanderchuk released a book, right? Yeah. And his newest book that's out, he even said it. He goes, I probably challenge you guys to get the audiobook and read it because he goes off script. So he oh. did it in such a way where there's a point he'll break in the chapter and you don't get that in the book, but you get it in the audio book. So when I see cool. when he got off, off script, I was like, oh my God, this, this is even better. It's landing even more now, you know, yeah. and things like that. So yeah, it's, yeah. it's good. Yeah, yeah. audio books, a lot of people love them. And they're, no, they're efficient. We can multitask. No, no, absolutely. Before we get out of here, right? I always like to give the guests their flowers and appreciating you coming on the podcast for the time that's here before we plug your information and things like that let's speak to how to become one percent better as far as navigating this world of relationship i know we've talked a lot about it but really mm -hmm. what's that number one thing that any man or woman should be listening to, to do how to become one percent better huh that's i don't know i touch on a lot of different things I think it's really, really know thyself. Really get to know yourself. It's, it, you're the most important project that you'll ever work on. And don't always believe your thoughts because a lot of times those, they're programmed and they're more about your ego. But go to the body. Like the body doesn't lie. Start to trust your gut more. Don't ignore it. Don't override it. I always say is this, the gut, the gut feeling is it's undefeated. It always tells the truth. It oh. always tells the truth and yep. get more connected to there and just keep staying curious about yourself and please don't judge yourself. Absolutely. Absolutely. I appreciate you saying that. Plug all your social inf social media, sorry, information. Where can yeah, everyone check out check you out? Instagram, book, all that good stuff. Yeah, Instagram. You can get me at the real Dr. Nadine. Direct message me. I answer all my own direct messages, as Rory knows. And um, I go to my website, drnay.com, where I have tons of free resources about relationships, love, trauma bonds, shame. And I'm on TikTok, the Wild West, uh, social media. Uh, what is my TikTok handle? Oh, Dr. Nay, N-A-E-L-M-F-T. And um, that's it. Get the book, Run Like Hell. Yeah, for sure. I'm definitely going to check out the book for sure. I'm already, already going to support that. We don't, so here's my thing about books. And I'll tell people this. You truly want to support the creator, 
go on your audiobook. I so if I want to buy it and I want to support support, what I'll do is I'll go to the um what is it the iBook store on uh, on Apple and I'll yeah. purchase it that way. None of that Audible stuff because like come on now, it doesn't support. You know what I yeah. mean? And right. then obviously definitely buy the book itself too. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. And then let me know what you think. Yeah, I for sure. I love hearing from my community. No, absolutely, absolutely. I do appreciate you once again. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks so much, Rory.